Vishwistamanamapi Vishwachiputram Atra Swarupam Rupam Tasagajamuri Purim Maturim Koshtvahati Radha Kunda Magiribaram Oh Radhika Omadavasam Prabhu Yasa Portito Kripaya Sri Guru Tam Natos Gurave Gaura Chandra Yoradika Itadali Krishnaya Krishna Bhaktaya Tad Bhaktaya Namo Nama First of all I offer my Sastang Dandavat Puspanjali, my heart, like flowers, thousands of times, mm-hmm. at the lotus feet of my holy master, my mm-hmm. supremely worshipful spiritual Gurudev, Asmadeya Paramarada Tam Guru Pada Padma, Neti Lila Pravisht Om Vishnu Par, Ashto Tarasatasi, Rupanuga Charivarya, Srila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. Secondly, I offer my pranam at the lotus feet of my Param Gurudev to Srila Prabhupada and to all of our Sri Rupanuga Gaudiya Guru Parampara. And finally, I offer my pranam to all the assembled Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis, Vancha Kalpa Turuva Sakrapas and Vaishnavi Bhivanamona. So, before I start, is there any question that you have on your mind that was you were thinking about for a long time but could not find an answer. Maybe after I will recall. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, Srimad Bhagavatam, very mercifully, Srila Prabhupada, in his old age, came to the West and rising every morning at one in the morning, he was translating Srimad Bhagavatam because he wanted to give us something, a great treasure. What is Srimad Bhagavatam? Mahaprabhu said, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Krishna Bhakti Rasa Swarup Sri Bhagavat Sarva Veda Shastra Hoitei Parama Mahatva that the Srimad Bhagavatam is the embodiment of all Bhakti Rasa. It is the uh, supreme of among all the Vedic literatures, there's no comparison. Gita, Veda Vedanta, Upanishads, nothing can compare to Srimad Bhagavatam. It's the, the last contribution of Vyasadeva. Why? Krishna Tulya Bhagavata Vibhu Sarvasrai Pratishloka Pratyakare Nana Artakai Mahaprabhu taught Sanatana Goswami Just as Krishna is all-powerful just as Krishna is the Savashray, that means the shelter, Sharnam, right? This place is called Sharnam. <laughs> Krishna is Sharnam, the shelter of all existence. So, in the same way, this book, Srimad Bhagavatam, is the shelter of everyone. Pratisloke, Pratiakari, in every word, in every verse, no, in every letter. Even there are many, many meanings. As Krishna is unlimited, this Bhagavatam is also unlimited. Amazing. Why? Because this Srimad Bhagavatam is Banmai Murti. It is the sound incarnation of Krishna. Just as Krishna appears in this world in the form of the Vigraha, the deity, so he has also a sound deity, a sound incarnation. And that is Srimad Bhagavatam. When this Kali Yuga was coming, at the beginning of Kali Yuga, all the sages in India gathered together in Naimisharanya forest. And they were very worried. What will happen in the future? Now Krishna has finished his pastimes and he's gone to the spiritual world. Who will protect Dharma religious principles? Who will give knowledge? 
discrimination between matter and spirit, between reality and illusion. So they're very worried, they pose this question. They could see in the future there will be so much uh, war, abortion, killing of animals, cows, and life will become like hell on earth. And those sages were worried about, though we were not even born yet, but 5,000 years ago, those sages, they were worried, they were concerned about us. So they asked this question, what will happen now? So then Sutta Goswami replied to them, Krishna iswa dhamu pagate dhamma jnana dibi saha kalau nashta dashamesha prana ko duno ditaha Now that see Krishna has returned to his own abode with all the power of Dharma and transcendental knowledge. But the sun has risen and that sun is Srimad Bhagavatam and that sun has risen to give light and vision to all those who have been blinded by the ignorance of Kali Yuga. So this is the significance of Srimad Bhagavatam. It's being compared to a transcendental sun that destroys all the darkness of this materialistic epoch. Now, the message of Srimad Bhagavatam, how it communicates with us, is very subtle. Jiva Goswami has quoted one verse, <coughs> Vedaha Puranam Kavyam Cha Prabhur Mitram Priyeva Cha Bodhyanti Ithi Prahus Trivrid Bhagavatam Punaha the meaning is this, that different kinds of people give instruction in different ways. So the first type means Prabhu, like a lord, like a king. When he speaks, he just gives orders, do this. Hmm? Then another kind of person, Mitra. Mitra means a friend. Friend doesn't order you about, right? Because friend has more affection and equality. So a friend, if a friend wants to teach you something, they'll just tell you a story about someone, let's say you're in a difficult situation. Then a friend might tell a, a story about a person who was in a similar situation and what he did and how it got worse and worse and worse. And what he really means is he's trying to tell you don't go in that direction. Right? Or a friend may tell a story about someone in a similar situation and what he did and how he became successful. So in this way, a friend will instruct his friend in a really friendly way through telling a story maybe about someone else. Mm -hmm. And then, the next one is Priya. Priya means a lover. If someone has a lover, then that lover instructs uh, his partner or her, par her partner or what to do not by even by direct words but just by hints by suggest the power of suggestion that is called Vyanjan Briti in Sanskrit the power of suggestion now in this verse it is said Veda Purana Kabyamcha the Vedas instruct us like a king because the Vedas give orders Satyam Bada, speak the truth. Dharma Charo, follow your religious principles. But the Puranas, they instruct us like a friend. So the Puranas, like the Padma Purana, the Vishnu Purana, they're full of stories. And these stories, if we hear them, we can understand some how to make the right choices in life. Hmm? But, hmm, Kavya, Kavya means poetry. The art of poetry is that the message is not in the words, but the message is in the suggestion. It's hidden in the suggestion. Huh? Just like one poet he said, 
When I was 16, I used to think that my father was a fool. Hmm? But now I'm 20. I think my father is actually quite smart. It's amazing how much progress he made in only four years. Okay? <laughs> so you're laughing. Now, there's nothing funny in these words, but you can feel behind it, right? You can feel there's a suggestion behind it. <laughs> right? This is called Dwani. So this is how poetry works. That is called Kavya. Poetry. So, now, so what this verse is saying, Bodhi and Iti Prahus, Trivrid, Bhagavatam, Punaha. The Srimad Bhagavatam, how does the Srimad Bhagavatam instruct us? Trivrid, that means in all three ways. Mm. Right? So sometimes the Srimad Bhagavatam tells us a direct order. Pibata Bhagavatam Rasamalayam Murahura Sikabu Vibhavaka. Oh, drink this nectar of Krishna Lila. It gives a direct order sometimes. Sometimes the Srimad Bhagavatam tells us a story. Like it may tell us the story of some sinful person like Ajamil. Do you know the story of Ajamil? So he was uh, just calling his son, Narayan, Narayan. But what happened? When the last moment of death came and the messengers of Yamaraj came to take him away, he called his son Narayan. And they couldn't take him away. The Vishnu Dutas came and stopped them. And he was saved by the power of the Holy Name. So, say for example, the story of Ajamil teaches us that the Holy Name is like fire. Hmm? Vastu Shakti Nahi Budim Mapekshate. Vastu Shakti means something that has its own power. Like fire, if you know that fire burns, it will burn you. But if you don't know that fire burns, it will still burn you. Because it has its own power. So in the same way, the Holy Name has power, if you know it has power. But what if you don't know it has power? It still has power. It still has effect. The Holy Name will destroy your karma. It will purify your consciousness. And it will bring you to the lotus feet of God. Even for an ignorant person. Because it has its own power. And that's the teaching. One of the important teachings. In the story of Ajamil. So the Srimad Bhagavatam is full of stories. These stories are full of teachings. But. Now we come to the third thing. What's the. What's the the third way of teaching through suggestion the power of suggestion in other words the teaching is not in the words but there's something behind the words that you feel and will really move your heart so the Srimad Bhagavatam is actually a masterpiece of Kavya poetry and its power is in the Vyanjan Briti, in the power of suggestion. Now the message of Srimad Bhagavatam, mm, what is that, the ultimate message? The ultimate message is love for Krishna. That's the message. The Srimad Bhagavatam doesn't want us to take anything else. The message of Srimad Bhagavatam is Prema Ras, the nectar of love for Krishna. Hmm? But, if one's heart is not soft and already feeling that love, then he will not be able to catch because it's presented in a very subtle way, very, very subtle way through Dwani. And therefore, the message of Srimad Bhagavatam has to be received in Parampara by the listening process, by the hearing process. Therefore, uh, in Chaitanya Charamrita he said, Jaha Bhagavata Pada Vaishnava Rastani Ekantarasrai Karu Chaitanya Tarani. There was a Brahmin from Bengal and he came to Puri. He said, I've written some poetry and I want to read it to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The devotee said, okay, you can, but you have to go to Mahaprabhu's secretary first and he'll listen and if he likes it, if he um, endorses it, then you can read it to Mahaprabhu because Mahaprabhu is very soft-hearted and if you'll hear something, um, Raso basa jadi hoi siddhanta virod sahitina prabhu pari prabhu mani hoi krod 
if Mahapur hear some wrong philosophy or some rasa bas, some mixed up uh, poetry, mixed up mellows of, of love, then though Chaitanya Mahapur is more humble than a blade of grass, but hearing these things, wrong philosophy and wrong rasa, he would get angry. He could not tolerate it. And this is why Saurabh Damodar was like a buffer, protection between him and the outside world. So then that poet, poet, uh, poet, he went to Swarup Damodar and he began to read his poetry. And when Swarup Damodar heard it, he said, Jaha Bhagavata Pada Vaishnava Rastani, Ekantara Sro Karo Chaitanya Charani, Chaitanya Rabakta Sangha Nitya Karo Sangha, Tabito Janibe Siddhanta Samudra Taranga. Very beautiful. He said, look, if you want to understand Srimad Bhagavatam, you have studied by yourself, but you misunderstood everything. There are so many mistakes in your poetry that, you, I'm sorry, you can't read to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. If you want to know the Bhagavatam, you should sit at the feet of a pure Vaishnava and listen to them and take shelter of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and by associating with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's very near and dear devotees who have realization, who have transcendental the experience, then listening gradually every day you will be able to enter into the waves in the ocean of the teachings of Srimad Bhagavatam. So then that poet, he became very humble, he was listening to some time and later he became a pure devotee also. So, because the actual message of Srimad Bhagavatam is not in the words, it's not in the paper and the ink, but it's in the dwani, the, so the power of suggestion. Therefore, it is said, evam parampara praptam imam rajasya vidu in Gita, Krishna said, this knowledge is coming down in parampara from one pure devotee to another. By hearing from them, they can open up the secrets of Srimad Bhagavatam. So, Srimad Bhagavatam, 18,000 verses. In a few minutes, what can I say? Not so much. But just one or two points, just in a nutshell, we want to try to express the dwani, the inner feeling of Srimad Bhagavatam. So, first of all, you know about Dhruva Maharaj, right? Dhruva Maharaj was a little boy. He tried to sit on the lap of his father, who was a king of the world. But his stepmother came and said, get off the lap. You cannot sit there, because you have not come from my womb. Hmm? If you worship God, and, in your, and he'll fulfill your desires. And in your next life, you can be, come from my womb, and then you can sit on the lap of the king. So then he was so sad. He was so sad. The little boy, he, he made a vow, I don't want my father's kingdom, I want to have a kingdom bigger than my father, bigger than my grandfather, bigger than my great-grandfather, even, better than... My. So, his father was uh, Uttanapad, and his father was Manu, and his father was Lord Brahma. So how can you get a kingdom bigger than Lord Brahma? Better than Lord Brahma, that's a quite a high ambition, high aspiration, because Brahma is in charge of the whole universe. Right? <laughs> so, but Dhruva, he was determined. So he went to the forest, because he, he heard that if you want to find Lord Narayan, the sages go to the forest. Hmm? But he was a little boy, he didn't understand that the sages go to the forest to meditate. So he was wandering around the forest and he was looking under the tree trunks and under the rocks. Narayan! Narayan, where are you? And when he was searching in this way, he met Narad, the great sage Narad. And Narad was very merciful to him and gave him a mantra. Om Namo Bhagavate. This one, this mantra. So, and he instructed Dhruva how to meditate on that mantra. So Dhruva stood on one leg 
He gave up eating, drinking, breathing, even for six months. And after six months, he swallowed the right in his heart. Then the next moment, oh, look, if you, there's Lord Narayan there on that painting right there with his two Shaktis, Sri and Bu. So he saw Lord Narayan in his heart, very beautiful. And then the next moment, that form disappeared. And it was very shocking for him. And he opened his eyes and he was crying. But when he opened his eyes, he saw that, that, that Narayan in his heart was standing in front of him. And when he saw that, he just bowed down again and again. And he wanted to pray, offer beautiful prayers. But he was only five years old, so he didn't know any. <laughs> so then Lord Narayan touched him with the Gonsha and he became filled with his power, power. and so then Dhruva Maharaj said Stana Bilasi Tapasi Stritoham Tvam Praktabam Deva Munindakuyam Kachan Vichimbang Api Divya Ratnam Swamin Kritato Spi Param Najachi Oh my Lord I was doing hard austerities, very hard austerities, to get a kingdom greater than my grandfather, to get a huge worldly kingdom. But now I realize that I was like a person looking for pieces of broken glass, worthless, that the whole universe is worthless. Because in that broken glass, I found the most valuable jewel, you. Hmm? If someone can find God, then they know everything else is useless. Because you will die and you will lose everything. But if we find God, it's forever. So then he said, Swami Kritatos Biparam Nadeate. Now I am completely satisfied. Actually, I don't want anything. Lord Narayan said, Oh Dhruva, you were doing your sadhan, your practice so hard with this strong desire to have a great kingdom. So I'm going to give you what you ask for. And he gave him a kingdom, he gave him a planet called Dhruvalok, which is like a Vaikuntha planet, it's a spiritual planet, but it's within the coverings of the universe. So it's greater than Brahmalok. So his desire was fulfilled. Huh? And Dhruva, on an aeroplane, he went there. Okay. So everyone knows the story. But what is the teaching? What is the Dwani? Like when I said that poetry, you just like immediately began to smile and laugh because you feel it. But what should we feel when we hear about Dhruva? The answer is this, that his bhakti was not pure. Why? Because he was remembering his mantra, he was chanting the name of God to get something. He was trying to get something. Uh -huh. So that is not pure bhakti. Pure bhakti is anya bilasta shunyam jnana kama dinavitamana guyena krishna nushyam bhakti uttama. Transcendental Bhakti is the continuous cultivation of all the activities of your body, your mind and your words, which are meant exclusively to give happiness to Krishna. Hmm? And it is not mixed with your own desires and with the karma and gyan and yoga sadhana, the desire for liberation or get mystic powers or anything like that. So the teaching of Dhruva Maharaj is that though he was doing very hard practice, but in his heart he didn't want God, he wanted something for himself. And because of that, though he went to Dhruvalok, he never got outside the coverings of the universe. It's still within the Brahmanda, the coverings of the universe. And so the Dwani here is that if you practice bhakti, don't do it for anything except for Krishna's happiness. That's the Dwani. So Dhruva Maharaj hasn't been included among the pure devotees. He's called 
Asakam Bhakta. A devotee Sakam with his own desires. So he's like a devotee, but not a pure devotee. Then, in Srimad Bhagavatam, we have another history. Do you remember Prahlad Maharaj? Mm -hmm. So Prahlad Maharaj, he is a pure devotee. Mm -hmm. Prahlad Maharaj, he was always chanting the holy names. His father put him in the demon school to learn all demon subjects like politics and diplomacy and economics, <laughs> how to control the world. But Prahlad never paid attention to this. Prahlad was just absorbed in Krishna. And instead of Prahlad turning into a demon, Prahlad made all the demons' children into devotees. And little Prahlad, little boy, was doing kirtan with all the demonic children. Hmm? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ramo, Hare Ramo, Ramo Ramo, Hare. And his teacher, Sandra Marker, came and said, Oh no, it's a disaster. We tried to make him into a demon, but he's turned all the little demons into devotees. And they told Hiranyakashipu, his father. And Hiranyakashipu became furious. And he came to Prahlad. And he said, Prahlad! Everyone, even the demigods in this universe, they're shaking with fear when I raise my eyebrow. Huh? Where do you get the power to defy me? And Prahlad Maharaj said, I get my power from the same place. You get your power. And from the same place that everyone gets their power. From Bhagavan, from God, from the Supreme Lord. Hmm? Hirani Kashipu said, you're always talking about some powerful person other than me. But where is this person? Prahlad Maharaj said, he's everywhere. Krishna is everywhere. Hirani Kashipu said, is he in this pillar? Prahlad Maharaj looked in the pillar and when he looked at the pillar, then he saw in the pillar, Lord Nishingdev was there and winking at him. And Lord Nishingdev winked, like this, and Prahlad Maharaj said, yes, he's in the pillar. Hirani Kashipu said, okay, now let me see him save you when I cut your head from your body. And then Hirani Kashipu punched the pillar with his fists, and then he was about to attack Prahlad Maharaj, when suddenly there was a huge roar, and there he is, Lord Nishingadev appeared, he's right there. It's really great at giving the class here, because everyone we need to speak about, they're all illustrated already. So, yeah, you can tell a little bit. Right yeah, yeah, that's he appeared. There he is. He's right there. Mm. He's behind you. So, Lord Nishinganev appeared, and he killed Hiranyakashipu. And after killing him, he was he was covered in blood, and he was roaring. Brahma, Shiva, everyone was afraid. Even Lord Shiva said to Lord Brahma, Oh Brahma, go and pacify the Lord with prayers. Lord Brahma said, You go and pacify the Lord with prayers. And I don't want to go. They said, Okay, let's ask Lachmi Devi. So they went to Lachmi Devi. The goddess of fortune said, Lachmi, your husband has come. Please go and see him and calm him down. She said, Of course. So then she decorated herself with beautiful ornaments and cloth and came with a veil and she came into the palace and she withdrew a cloth like this to look at him with a twinkle in her eye because when a woman looks at you with a twinkle in her eye that's it and the man he forgets his anger so she looked at him very attractively and Lord Rishingadev just went and roared and Lakshmi Devi ran for her life she told Brahma and Shiva no no I cannot do anything I've never seen my husband in such an angry mood before so no one would go near him but then Brahma and Shiva and Lakshmi they came to little little boy Prahlad they said Prahlad go and offer prayers to Nishingadev and pacify him Prahlad was not afraid because a lion is very ferocious to everyone but not to his cub to the baby lion the lion is very nice so Prahlad he went skipping skipping along he gave pranam and then he jumped and, and in the lap of Lord Nishingadev. And Lord Nishingadev was caressing him and licking him. 
Okay, he was doing Pashus Nehalila. That means the pastime of like an, how an animal shows affection by licking you. <laughs> then Lord Nisimhadev said, Oh Prahlad, I'm sorry I came so late. Because your father was giving you many problems, he tried to put you in fire, he tried to poison you, he threw you off a cliff, he put you with poison snakes. So Lord Nisimhadev said, Prahlad, Please forgive me for coming late. Then he said, I am very pleased with you. I want to give you a benediction. What do you want? What did Prahlad Maharaj say? My Lord, I am not a businessman that I was serving you to get some w wages, some pay. I just serve you for you. I am serving you for your happiness. I don't want anything. So if you want to give me a benediction, give me this benediction that there will be no more material desires in my heart. Huh? Is that beautiful? So beautiful. Compare Prahlad with Dhruva Maharaj. It's not the same. Dhruva Maharaj is great, but Prahlad Maharaj is greater. Because he said, I, have no, I don't want any desires in my heart. I just want to serve you. The Shingadev said, your heart is already pure. You have no material desires, so you should ask again for another benediction. Vlad Maharaj said, okay, give me this benediction that my father will not go to hell and suffer for all the attacks that he did on me. Let him be liberated. How beautiful is that? That all he wanted was the person who was trying to kill him, that he would not suffer. The Shingadev said, Hey Prahlad, if a person is a neophyte, Konishta Adhikari devotee, he is seven generations. His father, father's father, and father's father, and father, for seven generations they all get liberated. Right? Just a beginning devotee. And if someone is a Madhya Madhikari, a middle level of devotee, 14 generations are liberated. And if someone becomes a high level Uttam devotee, 21 generations are liberated. Said, so, Prahlad, don't worry about your father, he'll be fine. He's going to be liberated. So then, not only him, but your father's father and everyone. So, Lord Nishin has asked for another benediction. Prahlad Maharaj said, My Lord, then give me this benediction. That all the people in the universe, they are suffering due to bad karma. Give me their karma and let me suffer all of their karma and let them be liberated. Huh? What kind of person is this? His heart is so noble, he's so kind, he's ready to suffer the sins of everybody in the world so that they can be free. So then Nishingadev said, O oh, Prahlad, you have defeated me. I can't do that. Because the Lord won't, he can't make his own devotee suffer like that. He said, but I'll give you this benediction, that if anyone will hear our conversation together, then they'll be liberated and they'll attain praying, pure love for God. Haribo! So we heard the conversation, we're all going to be liberated now and get love for Krishna. So Prahlad Maharaj is great, greater than Dhruva Maharaj. This is the message of, this is the Dwani of Srimad Bhagavatam. But there's something more there that you may not be feeling. Because only the pure devotees can feel really the reverberation the inner meaning, which is not in the words. What is that? Hmm? The higher level devotees are very concerned here. Can you guess why? Hmm? Just like in Dhruva, there was some fault in him that he was doing bhakti for himself. Now, Prahlad is great, his bhakti is, uh, you know, he has no material desires. But is there anything missing? 
well, if the Bhagavatam was spoken for the people today, so there is no, there is nobody like Pranad. Practically, like Pralad, very few people like Pralad, yeah. Yeah, but it, 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 this scripture it will be for the people like us, so not Pralad. Mm -hmm. So maybe they, this was their concern. Their concern is this. That Prahlad didn't ask for anything for himself. He asked for his father, Hiranyakashipu, he asked for all the people of the world. But he didn't ask for anything for Lord Nishingadev. Consider it. Did Prahlad Maharaj give Lord Nishingadev, like when I came here, you said, oh, do you want some tea? As soon as I came. Did Prahlad Maharaj make a cup of tea for Lord Nishingadev? No. Did he fan him? Did he give him a massage? <coughs> no, this, the thing is this, that Prahlad sees Lord Nishingadev is God, right? And it's correct. And God <coughs> is called Atmaram, that means self-satisfied. God is Atmaram, self-satisfied, he doesn't need anything. He's not hungry, he's not thirsty, he's not tired, he's not hot. Because he's not hungry, you don't have to feed him. Because he's not thirsty, you don't have to give him anything to drink. Because he's not hot, you don't need to fan him. And because he's not tired, you don't need to give him a massage. So when you have knowledge that the, the form of God you're serving is God, all-powerful, then you don't serve Him. You can preach about Him, you can glorify Him to others, but you don't do anything directly for Him, because you think He doesn't need anything. So, Prahlad Maharaj is in the category called Jnani Bhakta. Jnani Bhakta. Jnani Bhakta, that means His Bhakti, His devotion is pure, but He has such knowledge of the opulence of God that he thinks that God himself doesn't need anything. And so that limits his um, expression of service. So Dhruva Maharaj doesn't fit in the definition of pure bhakti. Prahlad Maharaj fits in the de de definition of pure bhakti. But just about by the skin of his teeth. He just about gets within the definition. Anukuyena Krishna Nushilena service which is meant for the happiness of Krishna. He'll please Krishna by preaching to others about Him. But He's not doing anything directly for Krishna. So He, he goes in the definition of Bhakti, but just about only. Who's better than Prahlad Maharaj? Ambarish Maharaj. Hmm? Which canto is Ambarish Maharaj in? Is in? Do you remember? Close. No, the ninth. 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 Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. And Brish Maharaj is the last, in the last canto, before you get to the tenth canto. He's very important to prepare you to hear about Krishna. Now, Ambarish Maharaj, Savai Mana Krishna Padara Vindayo, but Changsi Vai Kuntu Gunana Vanane, Karo Hari Mandira Majana Dishu, Sute Chakar Atu to Satkato Daye. He utilized his mind in remembering Krishna, his words in describing Krishna. Though he had thousands of servants, he used to clean the temple with his own hands. He was the emperor of the world, but he used to get on his hands and knees and clean the floor himself. He used his ears to hear Harikatha. He used his nose to smell the flowers offered to the Lord his tongue to taste the Tausi offered to the Lord, his head to bow down to the deity of the Lord, his legs to go on Parikrama, his feet to do the Parikrama of Vrindavan. He was living in Mathura actually. And in this way, he, uh, he was serving and serving Krishna's devotees also. So Ambarish Maharaj is called a Shuddha Bhakta. He doesn't have any desires like Dhruva. He doesn't have the Gyan, the knowledge, oh well God he's got everything so I can't do anything for him. So he's called a Shuddha Bhakta, pure devotee. 
So Ambarish Maharaj is great, so very great. But you know who's better than Ambarish Maharaj? Let me see. He's got to be here somewhere. He's got to be here somewhere. Where's Hanuman? We got a Hanuman somewhere. Yeah, he's flying around somewhere there. I have a small Hanuman. You do? <coughs> no, but he's, he's over there. Oh, he's on the other side of the yes. room, okay. So Hanuman... Hanuman is no... Is no Hanuman no, uh, no, he gave is no, greater than Ambarish Maharaj. He, he, as a for hmm? he got After Ambarish Maharaj, one of the last stories <coughs> before the 10th canto is there's a, there's a brief... In, in the canto just the essence of the Ramayana. Ramayan. And Hanuman is there. So Hanuman is greater than Ambrish Maharaj. Why? Why could it be? He, he serves. <coughs> Ambrish Maharaj is serving with everything. Try again. <coughs> yeah, we don't let anyone sleep. You also have to do some work today. Not only me. <laughs> okay. When I explain it, then it will be very clear and obvious to you. And you say, it was l staring me in the face. Why didn't I realize? Ambarish Maharaj is a sadhak. That means a practicing devotee in this world. And he's trying to go to the spiritual world. In the spiritual world, he'll have a spiritual form. So the form you're serving with in this world is called your sadhak group, your practicing devotee form. Right? So you have this practicing devotee form, Nitai Goranga Das, your body is Swiss, and you look a particular way, but your soul is going to get a spiritual form, which is different from this form that you have now. Right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it will be. I guarantee. And... So that is called your, your Swarup, your Siddha Swarup. So Ambarish Maharaj is serving in his devotee form in this world. And after some time, he'll get his perfect form in the spiritual world. But what about Hanuman? Is Hanuman in his devotee form? And he has another form in the spiritual world? No. Hanuman has the same form in this world and the same form in that world. In, in fact, his form of Hanuman is in the spiritual world, in the transcendental Ayodhya of Lord Ram. And when Ram comes here, Hanuman comes from that world to this world in the same spiritual body. So he's got what's called Vastu Siddhi. Actually, he's a Nitya Parag, he's an eternal associate, but he's situated in his spiritual form forever. So, in that way, he is higher than Ambrish Maharaj. Ambrish Maharaj is practicing to get a spiritual form in the spiritual world. Hanuman, he is already in his spiritual form forever. Hanuman is amazing. After Lord Ram had gone to Ayodhya, sorry, Lanka, he went to Lanka. And he fought with Ravan. He killed Ravan. And he got his wife back. And then he brought Sita back to Ayodhya. And he came back to Ayodhya with Hanuman and all the monkeys who had fought in the battle. So then, just like after a big battle is over and the victory is won, then you have to give medals to everyone who fought in the war. Right? So, Ram was giving medals and gifts to all the monkeys one by one. So he called Sugriv, Angad, or Vibhishan also helped him. And he was giving them gifts and then sending them back to their country. So in the, in the medal giving ceremony, Hanuman was not there. He was hiding. Ram was calling. Hey, Hanuman! Has anyone seen Hanuman? They were asking everywhere. Find Hanuman. Tell him to come here. So they were searching everywhere. Finally they found him. And very shyly, Hanuman came into the palace. 
Lord Ram said, Hanuman, why are you not here in the ceremony? Why are you hiding? Hanuman said, because you're giving the, an award to everyone and sending them back where they came from. But I don't want to leave you. I don't want to leave you. So that's why I was hiding. Hanuman said, I don't need anything. I just want to serve you. Lord Ram said, Hanuman, I want to give you a gift. So then he said, Sita, you give him something. So then Sita had a pearl necklace, very beautiful necklace of precious, most valuable pearls. And she took it off and she gave it to Lakshman and said, please give this to Hanuman. So then Lakshman came and gave the necklace to Hanuman. Everyone was watching. There were hundreds of people in the royal court, the palace. So then Hanuman, he took the necklace and then what happens if you give a necklace to a monkey? What's he going to do? Start eating it, right? So then Hanuman, he took the necklace and he put one pearl in his mouth and he went crunch and he crushed it. And he opened it and he looked and then he spat it and threw it away. And then he got another pearl and a crunch and he crunched that and spat it and threw it away. Everyone was laughing. They were thinking the stupid monkey. You give him something valuable. But he's still a monkey from the jungle. And look what he's doing. He doesn't know how to appreciate this valuable gift. Everyone was laughing. Lord Ram said, Lord Ram wasn't laughing, he was very calm. He told everyone, shh, 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 He said, Hanuman, this necklace is very valuable. Why are you crunching up the pearls and spitting them out? Hanuman said, Oh my Lord, I am breaking these pearls and looking inside to see if your name is there, Ram, Ram, Jai Sri Ram. And if I look inside, if I see anything and your name is not there, then I think it's useless and throw it away. <laughs> because Hanuman understands in this world nothing has value, value nothing, not mountains of gold. Not millions of dollars. Yeah? Nothing. The only thing that has value is the holy name. Hmm? And for him, Ram, that's the name. Ram, Ram. So how great is Hanuman? We can tell his stories for the whole day and night, for go on forever. He's quite amazing. So, hmm? let's start from the beginning. What kind of devotee is Prahlad? Sakam. Sakam Bhakta, a devotee with desires. What type of devotee is, is, is Prahlad Maharaj? Uh, Dhruva Maharaj uh, is Sakam. Sakam. He has desires. Uh, what type of devotee is Prahlad? Jnani Bhakta. He's a devotee, but he thinks God is all powerful, he doesn't need anything. And better than him, Ambarish Maharaj. What kind of devotee is he? Do you remember? Shuddha Bhakta. Pure devotee. Shuddha Bhakta. But better than Ambarish, because he's, he's in this world practicing, is Hanuman. Because he already has his spiritual form. That he comes from the spiritual world to here and goes back again. So Hanuman is called a Premi Bhakta. A Premi Bhakta, he has pure love. Premi Bhakta. But do you know who's better than Hanuman? Hmm? I'll give you a clue. Arjun. Yes! Arjun! <laughs> Why is Arjun? Greater than Hanuman. When Krishna goes to visit the Pandavas, 
Not only Arjun, all five brothers. Yudhisthira, Bhim Singh, Arjun, Nakul and Sahadev, Kunti, their mother, and Draupadi, their wife, they are all even greater than Hanuman. Because Hanuman is the servant of Lord Ram. But the love of Arjun is so great. When Krishna sees the love of Arjun, then Krishna thinks, oh, I want to serve you. Hmm? Hanuman carried Ram and Lakshman on his shoulders and carried them flying across the world. So Hanuman became like the chariot of Lord Ram. But for Arjun, Krishna, he became the chariot driver of Arjun. He's so great. Hanuman, if you look on the oh, you can't see from this, but there's a flag on the top of the chariot of Arjun, and Hanuman is living on the flag of Arjun, personally living there. And when Arjun goes into battle, Hanuman roars to terrify all of the enemies. So Hanuman is serving Arjun because Arjun is so great. He's so great. One day, Krishna went to the palace of Arjun in Hastinapur and they were taking, they were eating together and then after eating they both lay down to take rest on the same bed. Arjun's head was this end of the bed and his feet were this end of the bed and Krishna's head was this end of the bed. And his feet were that end of the bed. They're lying on the same bed, but opposite way around to each other. And while they were sleeping, Arjun was holding the feet of Krishna on his heart. And Krishna was holding the feet of Arjun on his heart. At that time, Narad Muni arrived there. And he came in the palace and he looked. And he saw Arjuna and Krishna lying there and sleeping like this, <laughs> holding each other's feet. And he came close and he could hear them, how they were breathing. And when Arjuna in his sleep, he was going, Krishna, 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 Krishna. And Krishna, Arjuna, Arjuna. Nard Muni started dancing. Haribo, Haribo, Haribo. And he was singing the names Krishna Arjun, Krishna Arjun, Krishna Arjun. How much love is there between Krishna and the Pandavas? Krishna became the chariot driver. He was their messenger. He was their personal advisor. In the battle of Kurukshetra, they were living in a camp. So you distinguish the king, he has to have some security standing outside his, his, his tent at night. Krishna was taking up a weapon outside the tent of Yudhisthira as his security guard. Krishna tries to serve the Pandavas, their love is so great that Krishna tries to serve them in all ways. It's amazing. You know that once Arjun was riding on his chariot and he was trying to go on a road but there was a big monkey kind of lying there in the road and he couldn't get by. He said, hey monkey, move out the way. The monkey said, who are you? He said, I am Arjun. The great warrior, archer. Who are you? Monkey said, I am Hanuman, the servant of Lord Ram. Arjun said, Oh, you're one of those monkeys of Lord Ram. You had to collect so many stones and put them in the ocean and make a bridge going to Lanka. You know the story? All the monkeys, they were collecting. Hanuman was taking the tops of mountains and carrying them, flying and putting them in the ocean, and they made a bridge to Lanka. 
Arjun said, Hanuman, you Hanuman, you made the bridge to Lanka. But if I had been there, I would have just said a mantra and shot at one arrow and by my arrows, I would have built a bridge all the way to Lanka in one moment from arrows and mantras. Hanuman said, yes, that may be true. But if you had made a bridge out of your arrows, he would not be able to stand the weight of even one of us monkeys. Because they like Katrius. No, Katrius, they like to brag about their heroism. Hanuman said, it will not take the weight of even one of us monkeys. Arjun said, I challenge you. I'll make a bridge across this river with my arrows. And you'll just walk across the bridge and you'll see how strong I am. So then Arjun took an arrow, chanted mantra, it multiplied, became so many arrows, and he made a bridge across the river. When Hanuman saw it, it was a really strong looking bridge. Very strong looking bridge. Hanuman said, Hey, wait a minute, I'll be back. He quickly flew off. He went to the Himalayas. He got thousands of mountain tops. And he tied the mountain tops onto every hair on his body. And then he came back. <coughs> shaking the earth with thousands of mountain tops tied onto every hair of his body. When Arjun saw this, he thought, Oh, Krishna. I don't know if my bridge is going to stand up. So then Hanuman. He put his first foot on the bridge. And when he put his first foot on the bridge, the wooden bridge was creaking. It was creaking. Now Hanuman thought, when I put my first step on it, it's going to break. So when he put his foot on it, and it didn't break, Hanuman was praying, Oh my Lord Ram, please, protect the dignity, the prestige of your servant. Because your servant's prestige is your prestige. So please save the prestige of your servant and let this bridge break. And at the same time that Hanuman was praying, Oh my Lord Ram, please save me. Arjun was really worried and he was praying, Oh Krishna, I am your servant. <laughs> Please save the prestige of your servant. <laughs> so, you have this situation now. Two great devotees, they're both praying to God. But God is one. They're not two gods. There's only one God. <laughs> but he appears in different ways to his different devotees. So now what will happen? Hanuman was just about to put his second foot on the bridge. When he looked down, he saw that blood was coming in the water. There was blood flowing in the river. He thought, what's that? Arjun saw the blood as well. So the both of them came and looked under the bridge. And Hanuman saw Lord Ram was under the bridge holding it up. And Arjun saw Krishna was under the bridge holding it up. They were both seeing the same person. But because of their love, the type of love that they have, Hanuman was seeing it was Lord Ram and Arjun was seeing it was Krishna. Amazing. You see? Supreme Lord had fulfilled the desires of both devotees. Because if Arjun's bridge was strong enough, then Krishna wouldn't have had to come to hold it up. But, because he came to hold it up, it didn't break. And so, he protected the prestige of both devotees. But then, the Supreme Lord said to Hanuman, He said, you are my servant. Hmm? But Arjun has such love that I become his servant. So you should also become his servant. And go onto his flag. And that was the day that Hanuman took a position on the flag of Arjun. So you look at the, any Bhagavad Gita on the front cover, the charity is there, the flag is there, and, and Hanuman is there because of this pastime. 
So because you never forget this, Arjun has more love even than Hanuman. His love is so amazing that not only is the servant of the Lord, the Lord becomes his servant. Can Hanuman sit on the same seat with Lord Ram? Can Hanuman sit on the same bed with Ram? No. Hanuman's always on his knees. You see Sita Ram like Hanuman's on his, on his, at the feet of Ram on his knees. You see? So Hanuman is great. But he's, because his mood is Dasya, I am a servant. He takes a lower position. But Arjun, because he's Sakya, he's a friend, he takes an equal position. And sometimes Krishna becomes his servant, either. like friends serve each other out of love. So, Hanuman is a Premi Bhakta. He's great. But Arjun is called Prema Para Bhakta. He has Prema Para. Supreme love. Mm -hmm. Now, the Srimad Bhagavatam tells all the stories of these people. But what I'm telling you is not the story. But coming in the Guru Parampara, since the time of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Rupa Goswami, Sanatana Goswami, what is the Dhwani? The suggestion behind the story, the hints that a person should pick up to understand the message of Srimad Bhagavatam, which is a message only of pure love. So in the Bhagavatam, there is a person greater than Arjuna. Who is that? His cousin, Krishna's cousin, Uddhav. Vrishni nam pravamro mantri Krishna sya daita sakha Sakshat brihaspato isisyo Uddhavo buddhisattamaha It is said, of all the advisors of Krishna, in the Vrishni dynasty, Vrishni Nam Pravaroman 3, the main one is Uddhav. Krishna Sya Daita, he is so dear to Krishna. Sakha, he is Krishna's very dear friend. He knows so many secrets. You know, when Krishna was walking through Mathura, one hunchback girl came and grabbed him by the cloth and was pulling. So, uh, actually, she was just there with some fragrances and sandalwood paste. And Krishna said to her, that, was, that sandalwood paste and fragrance was for Kamsa. He said, oh, those things for the king, give them to me. Kubja, she was attracted by the beauty of Krishna. So she took those fragrances and that sandalwood paste and she smeared it all over the body of Krishna. And then Krishna, he stepped on her toes and he put his two fingers underneath her chin and went and gave her a spinal adjustment. And at once, from being a hunchback, she became a very beautiful woman, very beautiful young woman. And Krishna, he was leaving and she grabbed him by the dhoti and she was pulling his dhoti and saying, come back to my place. Krishna was a bit embarrassed in front of his friends. He said, listen, I've got business to do now, but I promise you, I'll come later. So then, because Krishna was, where, is, where was he going? He's on his way to the wrestling arena. He had some business with Kamsa. And you know what happened next, right? So Krishna killed Kamsa Maharaj. And after killing Kamsa Maharaj, later, secretly, he went to fulfill his promise to Kubja. Now, he was embarrassed when Kubja was putting his dhoti in front of his friends. But when he went to visit Kubja, he secretly, he took one friend with him. Who was that? Uddhav. So Uddhav is very, very close to Krishna. When Krishna was in Mathura, 
One day when he got back from Gurukul, he went on the roof of the palace of Vasudev Maharaj and he looked at the Jamuna and when he saw the Jamuna, there were high waves, very high waves were coming, it was very turbulent. Why? Because the gopis of Vrindavan, they were crying so much in Vrindavan that their tears were going in the Jamuna and it was causing it to overflow. Because the Jamuna comes from Vrindavan first and then goes to Mathura. So when Krishna saw the Mathura, the, the, the Jamuna in Mathura, he began to remember Vrindavan and he was crying. He thought, I have to send a message to Nanda Maharaj, my father. I have to send a message to Madhya Yashoda and my coward boyfriends and the gopis. He was thinking, who shall I send? It's very tricky. Who can be a messenger to send my, to deliver my message to Vrindavan? It's hard to find a person. Why? If I find a person who has knowledge that I am God and he goes to Vrindavan and sees them all crying, then he'll make offense to the residents of Vrindavan. Why? Because he will think, why are they crying? God's everywhere. You're saying that God has left you, but God is everywhere. So God is always with you. Why are you crying? And he may criticize the residents of Vrindavan. On the other hand, if I send someone who doesn't know that I am God, and he goes to Vrindavan and sees how everyone is crying, then that person may criticize me and say, why did Krishna leave these people who love him so much, who raised him his whole life and gave him everything? So Krishna was thinking, I have to ask a person who has a mood, he, he knows that I am God, but sometimes he forgets. And so he can have sympathy for those who have knowledge that I am God and sympathy for those who don't have knowledge that I am God. Such a person who has a mixture of Aishwarya Gyan, knowledge of my opulence, and Madhurya Gyan, knowledge of my sweetness, he could be the only one qualified to deliver this message. And just as Krishna was thinking in that way, Uddhav was going around the palace, but where's Krishna, where's Krishna? And he came up onto the roof and he saw Krishna there. And Uddhav came on the roof and he saw Krishna there and he saw Krishna crying and he'd never seen Krishna crying before. He thought Krishna is Bhagavan, he's God. He's Sachid Ananda, he's full of joy. How can the person who's Ananda, full of joy, cry? And Krishna held the hands of Uddhav in his hand. And he said, Gatschuddhava Brajam Som Ya Pitro Na Piti Mabaha Gopi Nam Mat Yoga Din Mat Sandeshar Vimochaya Srimad Bhagavatam. This verse is from Srimad Bhagavatam. He said, Go Uddhav. Go to Braj and pacify my mother and father who are missing me so much and give my message to the gopis. I'll give you some messages, I want you to deliver them to the gopis. So then Uddhav, he didn't want to leave Krishna. He's Krishna's devotee, he doesn't want to leave him. Krishna understood that Uddhav didn't want to leave. So he said, Uddhav, he said, you are seeing me here in Mathura, but this is not really me. This is not fully me. This is only like a reflection. I always live in Vrindavan. When you go to Vrindavan, you realize that I am always there. Hmm? So then U Krishna explained to Uddhav about the love of the residents of Vrindavan. Then Uddhav had some greed. Oh, I want to see persons who have this love that Krishna is describing. Man mana, ta man manaska mat prana, mada te chattudaita. Krishna said, the gopis of Vrindavan are just with great struggle managing to stay alive. 
They're just about managing to hold their pran in their body. And the only reason they can stay alive and hold their pran in their body is because when I was leaving, I said, I told them, I will return. Because if they thought I weren't coming back, they would die at once. And only this hope, Pratyagamana Sandesha, Balavo Me Madatnaka, only the hope that I will return is keeping them alive. So when, Ar when Uddhav heard about the love of the residents of Vrindavan, especially the gopis of Vrindavan, then some greed came in him. He said, I want to see such persons. So then Krishna gave Uddhav his own yellow cloth. He gave him his own garland. Uddhav is, has a dark complexion like uh, Krishna. He looks very much like Krishna. Now he smells like Krishna with Krishna's garland and Krishna's cloth. And he told, he bought his servants to say, bring the chariot. And they bought the same golden chariot that Akrura, it was Kamsamara's chariot, that Akrura came to Vrindavan and took Krishna to Mathura. That very same chariot. And he put uh, Uddhav on the chariot and he told him, now go and deliver my messages. So then, yeah, he made the horses go and Uddhav set off to Vrindavan. But you should understand, it wasn't the horses that were pulling him to Vrindavan. He was being pulled by the power of his lobe. That means greed, spiritual greed. Because no one can go to transcendental Vrindavan without greed, spiritual greed. And that spiritual greed only comes by hearing the glories of the bridge buses, Nanda, Nanda Maharaj, Yashoda. Simati Radhika, Lalita, Vishaka, and so on. If someone will hear about them from a pure devotee, then a greed will come in their heart and that greed can carry them to Vrindavan. So Uddhav, he went to Vrindavan. It's a very long story and I already spoke too much today. But just to summarize, when Uddhav saw Radharani, and the gopis crying. Radharani was in such madness of love for Krishna, she was even quarreling with a bumblebee, thinking that this bumblebee was a messenger sent by Krishna. And when Uddhav saw this, he said, Asam maho charana reinu dusam maham syam brindava neikim api gulmala tausha dinam ya justa jam swajana aya patam tahitva bejo mukunda padavim shruti ve vimrigyam I thought that I was a great devotee. Right? Uddhav is greater than Dhruva, greater than Prahlad, greater than Hanuman, Ambarish Maharaj, he's greater than Hanuman, he's greater than Arjun even. But Uddhav, when he saw the love of the gopis and Radharani, he said, I thought that I was a great devotee. But now I realize I'm nowhere. I know where. I am like a person at the bottom of Mount Everest. And my intelligence, by which I understand bhakti, is like a hat. And I'm trying to look and see the top of the mountain. And as I look up, it's so high, I can't even see where it ends. And my hat fell off and fell on the ground. That means my int I have no power. My intelligence cannot touch the extent of the love of Radha and the gopis of Vrindavan. So, I would be very lucky in my future life if I could take birth as a blade of grass in Vrindavan. I can't be a coward boy or a coward girl. I'm not qualified. I'm not qualified to be a cow. I'm not even qualified to be a bird. I'm not even qualified to be an ant in Vrindavan. But if I could be a blade of grass, then when the gopis hear the sound of Krishna's flute, they don't go on the path, they just run through the forest. 
they go directly to Krishna. Then when they're running to Krishna, if I could be grass, they may step on me and I'll be touched by the dust of their feet. And if I could touch the dust of the feet of the gopis, then I could realize two and a half letters. You know, in India there's a saying, Dayakshar, Dayakshar ka jani wale sabse bar pandit hai. Who is the greatest pandit? Not the person who knows all Sanskrit. Not the person who knows all the Shastras. The greatest pandit, the most learned person, is that person who understands two and a half letters. Hmm? I'll show you, these are the two and a half letters. That's one, that's two, and this is the half. Prem. Prem. The word Prem. The one who knows the meaning of praying, love, is the greatest pandit. And Udo said, I am nowhere. These gopis have left everything for Krishna. They gave up the path of Dharma, the path of the Vedas. So one may say, how can you glorify these gopis? They don't follow the Vedas. Udo said, no, no, no. The gopis don't need to follow the Vedas. The Vedas need to follow the gopis. Hmm? So you can see in the end of the tenth canto, the prayers of the Vedas personified. They say the Vedas themselves offer prayers. Vayamma picha sama sama dushangri soroja sudha. We are doing bhajan by trying to follow in the footsteps of the gopis of Vrindavan by which we can become perfect. So the gopis don't follow the Vedas. The Vedas follow the gopis. So in the end Uddhav prayed Vande Nanda Brajay Strinam Pada Rehnum Abhikshna Saha Yasam Harikotud Gitam Punati Bhuvanatrayam I bow down again and again and again forever. Eh? just to one particle of dust, foot dust, of Braj Gopis. Now you should understand that one dust cannot be on two feet. So he's praying here, he means one particle of dust on the foot of Simati Radhika. I bow down to her foot dust continuously and offer prayers. Yasam Harikatud Gitam Punati Bhuvanatrayam. When these gopis speak about Krishna, even when they criticize him, oh, he's a thief, he's a, he's a rascal, he's a rogue. But when the gopis speak the words of Krishna, their words are so full of love that they purify all the three worlds. The whole universe is purified. Hmm? So, uh, five types of bhaktas. First, Dhruva, Sakam Bhakta. He has the material desire. <coughs> then, Prahlad, Jnani Bhakta. He has no desire. But his Lord, he does not serve directly because he thinks he doesn't need anything. Ambarish Maharaj, he's a Shuddha Bhakta, pure devotee, but he did not attain his spiritual form yet. So Hanuman is better, he's a Premi Bhakta, he has his eternal spiritual form, but he does not feel equality, he cannot sit on the same bed as Ram, he cannot eat from the same plate. Hmm? Not like the coward boys in Vrindavan. They eat something, they taste it, they bite it first. Oh, this tastes so good, Krishna, you try it. And they put it in Krishna's mouth. <laughs> it's so close. <laughs> so Hanuman, he has some limitations. So great, he's a Premi Bhakta. But the Pandavas are Prema Parabhaktas. And greater than the Pandavas is Uddhav. He's called Prema Atura Bhakta. Atura means tormented. He's tormented that his brain is never enough. Because when he went to Vrindavan, he realized, I'm nowhere. So the residents of Vrindavan, they're not even in uh, five types of bhaktas, they're not even included in any of them. They are beyond all of those categories. Hmm? And the highest of all is the gopis, and among them, Shimata Radharani. 
So in this way, we've tried to give a little overview of the whole Srimad Bhagavatam, what is the power of suggestion that this poetry is giving to us. And the message is this, Radha Dasa, try to become the servant of Radharani. There is nothing higher that anyone can possibly attain. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came into this world. This service of Radha was never given before in this day of Lord Brahma, since the last time Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came, was never given before. And now Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, through his associates, the six Goswamis, and through their pure Guru Parampara, and through the holy name, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Radha and Krishna themselves combined, and they've come to give this highest love, which the Srimad Bhagavatam is only hinting at through the power of suggestion. Gaur Premanande Hari Hari Bo.